In this video, I'll distill all the most powerful, relevant training principles and methods I know for you to program your own movement training as quickly and concisely as I possibly can. The first step is understanding. You can't program for something you're not aware of. To make this more clear, I've isolated 16 fundamental axes of movement training. Briefly, if your body was a computer, four of these axes would map to hardware and 12 would map to the operating system or software. The hardware places some limits on what is theoretically possible, but you can't do anything without the software side. The hardware axes are the ones we traditionally think of and train in fitness, strength, how much force you can produce in various positions and ranges. Mobility, what ranges of motions and positions you can access. Cardio, your body's ability to do work over a sustained period of time. Resilience, the loads and volumes you can handle without pain. The software axes are usually far more limiting than the hardware and movement. They are footwork, how well your feet can organize your body and its movement through space. Somatics, our awareness of and control over our internal environment. Explosive force production, the coordination to generate large amounts of force quickly for many different vectors. Motor digestion, the ability to see, understand, digest, then recreate movements with accuracy and speed. Interfacing, configuring your positioning and relationship to or with your external environment. Balance, the ability to or prediction of keeping weight stable over support points. Orientation, awareness of the body's positioning relative to the external environment, particularly while in flux and for extended durations. Musicality, the ability to sense and express the characteristics of music, particularly rhythm through movement and vice versa. Fine motor control, the ability for detailed control and coordination of small movements and forces. Softness, the ability to dissipate or transmit forces, tension, and impacts. Elasticity, the ability to generate lightness, quickness, and reactivity in the body. And research, the ability to refine or generate new movements, particularly with respect to a given function or task. These 16 axes are not mutually exclusive within movement, and I've found that these are the ones that are the most fundamentally limiting. Most people work out to look good, some for strength, others mobility, and still others cardio. But in a movement practice, we aim to develop ourselves on all of these axes through a focus on skill and function. You can organize your training around these axes or certain disciplines, but generally, I'll recommend a mix of both. We'll come back to this in a moment. Functionally, the most important variable when designing a program is the amount of time allocated per week. Generally, assume that you'll make a linear amount of progress for each unit of training you do. It's like languages. You can study and speak immersion style 10 hours a day and learn one language to conversational fluency in two to three months, or one hour a day for two to three years, or 10 minutes a day for 10 years. But I suggest that the complexity of movement on the whole is comparable to the combined complexity of every language known to man. Movement, of course, is far more complex than language, but we're also much better suited for it. And far more of the brain and body is devoted to and developed for movement rather than language. I would therefore highly recommend you devote a significant chunk of time to your training if you wanna be any good at it. However, this must come from a place of stability. You can train 10 hours a day for two weeks, quit and not learn or develop much of anything. Or you can train two hours a day for 10 years and become an incredible practitioner. Water can cut through rock given time and consistency, and even 20 to 30 minutes a day of quality practice can give great results when applied relentlessly. Choose an amount of time that you can sustain for the long term, but be careful to also do enough that you'll make significant noticeable progress within the first two weeks, which can be the most critical period for habit formation. I know it takes time now, but the research is very clear that a lot of this time comes for free since it will extend your lifespan by years and your health span by even more. Generally, the rule is anything you wanna get, high frequency will get you there faster. High frequency, breaking your training into more sessions per week will allow you to do more training volume at greater quality with less fatigue leading to more gains. And I think it can be easier to maintain habits when you do them consistently every day rather than every other day or less. A study was done on a Norwegian powerlifting team years back. And they took the team and split them into two groups. One group did a full body routine three times a week, and the second group did the same program 
split into six weekly sessions. The high frequency group made significantly more progress even with the same amount of total work. And since then, not only has this study been replicated, but I believe that the real world effect of high frequency training will be even greater for movers since frequency allows more volume and that volume won't have a real physiological limit for skill work which we have enormous amounts of. Functionally, the general go-to for movers is training twice a day, six days a week, with sessions split into bent arm strength, straight arm strength, and lower body strength, each performed twice a week, and handstand, locomotion, mobility session, more skill-based, six days per week. If your training location is far from you, and you aren't doing much more than one hour of training per day, you can collapse that into one session, six days a week. And you can change the structure of the session types. Just make sure you're doing strength work twice a week per muscle group minimum, and stretching minimum five days per week for reasonably optimal progress. For most beginners and intermediate practitioners, take your total training time and allocate 40 to 50% of it to the hardware axes, up to a cap of six hours per week. Within this, allocations should vary depending on who you are and what you need. For flexibility, range of motion adaptation seems to top out at around five to 10 minutes of stretching per muscle group per week. I suggest you use the powerful full body routine I designed here, but if you design your own, stay within that dosage and choose a few valuable exercises you can do every day. I highly recommend developing the pancake and the bridge as part of that, and you incorporate the resting squat as a part of your daily life. If there's an area that's really limiting for you, like my ankles have been for me, the big number from Quinn Hennock is about 20 minutes per muscle group per week to actually physiologically change the length of the tissues. We'll do a whole video on how much you should train soon, so we'll cover this briefly for now. For strength work, the research seems to suggest that adaptations are linear up to at least 10 sets per muscle group per week. So make sure you're hitting that at a minimum. For movers, it is of absolute critical importance that you choose exercises that are as functionally relevant as possible. You should have some output from the strength you develop in your strength work to skills and disciplines that you do outside of your strength work. And unless you have an extremely good and specific reason, you should always perform them through the largest range of motion possible and work to increase that range of motion over time, which will accomplish two tasks with one stimuli increasing your strength and mobility at the same time. For any work you do, progressions can make or break your training. Ideal progressions target the central problem of anything you're working on at an ideal and appropriate intensity. For instance, in learning a handstand, the central three problems are one, the skill of balance and rebalancing the handstand, two, the resilience and capacity of the wrists, and three, the strength and strength endurance of the upper body in the overhead position. So you can do alignment work and core strengthening until the cows come home, but if you aren't working on those three central problems, your handstand's gonna progress at about the speed of my recent romances. And we don't want that. The other central problem with progressions is jumps in intensity. Many people want to start working on the one-arm handstand the moment they catch a 30-second handstand. But this is like trying to go straight from squatting with 100 pounds to 400 pounds. With weightlifting, we can bridge this gap one pound at a time. But with bodyweight skills, this often gets way more complicated. So we get that two-arm handstand rock solid. Then we get the different shapes. Then we get different entries rock solid. One arm's against the wall to build the physical capacity. Then movement between those different shapes rock solid. Your two arm handstand becomes not significantly harder than standing on your feet. Then, and only then, do we start working on shifting weight between the hands and gradually reducing the assistance of the support hand. Because otherwise, the intensity of that next progression becomes so overwhelming that you can't accumulate any significant volume of it. When you invariably do find yourself in this situation with something you're working towards, see how you can break the central problems into manageable chunks, then pour volume into the easier progressions to make those jumps as small as possible. With cardio, typical work is extremely repetitive and therefore of low value to movers. So much so that for many years, I completely discarded any dedicated cardio. But in recent years, I've seen great value to cardio in certain situations. In grappling, strength and mobility will allow you to make moves that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. Yet these can become crutches that you overly rely on. Having good cardio allows you to continue working on your techniques in real life situations without it being overly stressful on your body. In effect, greatly increasing your effective practice density and likely recovery. Now, let's start actually building a session. I like to start and end all my classes with a short stillness. And while that's extremely important for your somatic development and helping you drop into your body and that sensation of embodiment, 
Where you place that stillness in the day is up to you. I would say qualitative differences in state start with five seconds to five minutes, allowing you to drop into the present and relax, and 10 to 60 minutes to go deeper and start more transformational work. Choose something that works for you, but keep in mind, these will often be more energizing than draining. See my meditation video for one of my favorite methods here. Next, some sort of warm up. I like to have some general mobility work before certain elements or specific warm ups before weightlifting work, like doing a few quick reps to groove the movement and open up the positions with each significant weight I add to the bar. Start to feel what you need and what works best for you over time. And keep in mind that warm ups will generally decrease your injury risk, which will be of huge value over the long term. But we also don't want to spend too much time here, and we definitely don't want to be wasting our time repeating one movement over and over and over again. See how you can incorporate movement complexity into your warm ups. For instance, in BJJ, maybe, for the love of God, could we please stop doing the same shrimps, forward rolls, and running in circles every day in every gym I visited all around the world? Maybe we can do some flow rolling or light situational sparring. For instance, when I visited Keenan's gym in LA, we warmed up by trading sweeps with a partner. Now you're warming up, but you're also practicing your break falling, maybe your forwards and backwards rolls, and you're getting random recall of all the sweeps you know, reinforcing your skills and memory at the same time as the joints and muscles in the specific positions that you're gonna need in the training. Another warm up I really favor is just inviting people to play with a certain topic for 10 to 15 minutes. How can you interact with the environment and or the partners around you? Maybe you research falling, spinning, interacting with the wall, interacting with the floor, muscle tone, head position, gaze, inversions, rolling, spinning, making faces or sounds, playing with a partner, a bench, a table, a car, should be your own car, literally anything you can think of, you can play with that concept in movement extremely productively. Another great one is that I love to invite people with even a little bit of experience to spend 10 to 15 minutes creating new moves. That might sound intimidating, but in years of teaching it, I've never seen a single person fail to come up with something new. And I doubt you'll be the first. Next up can be a nice spot to put your mobility work in. If you're doing a more skill-based session, this is easy peasy, and it will allow you to easily access and reinforce the mobility you've just opened during the rest of the work. But the research suggests, while static stretching is more effective for increasing range of motion, if you're doing a more static routine like the one I've designed, you're gonna want some sort of warm up after the routine before you do any sort of explosive strength or power work. Otherwise, you just put yourself at increased injury risk and decrease your power output. Then we start getting to the meat of the session. Generally, any session you do, we wanna start with the more skilled work first and then do the strength or more demanding work near the end. Otherwise, you risk trying to do technical work when you're already muscularly fatigued and in a suboptimal state. When you do your strength work, start with the biggest and most fatiguing work first, since they're the most important, and then work your way down through accessory movements into any isolations you deem necessary. The rest intervals you choose for this are very important. If you don't rest at all, your muscles will fatigue extremely quickly at any significant intensity, and you won't be able to get much quality volume. But if you rest too much, your sessions can easily become three hours long without you getting much quality volume in either. Generally, your muscles want about three to five minutes between sets to recover about as fully as they can for maximal progress. But here's one of the greatest training tricks I've ever learned. You can conjugate exercises with opposing muscle groups, push-pull for the upper body and anterior-posterior chain for the lower body, and then you can essentially double the work density while keeping the same local rest for each muscle group. Do some version of this for most, if not all, of your strength work, and then the sweet spot for rest will basically become 60 to 90 seconds between exercises. Sometimes I like to take those rest intervals up to two, three minutes and fill them with skill projects that aren't significantly physically demanding, like juggling, rail work, or single leg balance tasks. But that's up to you and how you feel if it affects the quality of your work sets. But what should you actually be working on? For your strength work, some basic targets. Men should work to approach a 2x body weight back squat, 2.5x body weight deadlift, 1.25 body weight clean, and a body weight snatch. And ladies, you can drop those targets by about a third. Everyone should work towards a few handstand push-ups, muscle-ups, solid German hangs, and stall depresses. For mobility, a good bridge with the elbows locked and shoulders stacked vertically over the wrists, chest to floor pancake, full front splits, and a deep and comfortable squat. If any of those sound completely unapproachable to you, I know how you feel. I started this work as an adult with none of these capabilities whatsoever. Those of you who saw my recent mobility video know how much trouble I've had with my squat, 
and I've been working on it for about a decade now, and I still have new students that come in never having consciously worked on it in their lives with a much better squat than me. I still work on it every day, and I have high hopes that if and when I really do get it, that I'll be able to inspire many of you with a story. Don't worry about what may or may not be possible. Get to work intelligently and you'll be surprised how far you'll go. You guys ask me constantly, how do I balance my training for movement? Generally, you should take your hours of training per day after you've removed the hardware time that we discussed earlier, multiply that by two and work no more than that number of projects at one time. So if you train three hours each day, subtract one hour for hardware, then multiply by two and you might work four projects say hand balancing, grappling, locomotion, and juggling in one phase. For choosing your projects, some things will be determined by local logistics. If I'm living near one of the best BJJ academies in the US, you better bet I'm probably gonna be going to more jujitsu classes. But honestly, a lot of our training is driven by interest. And at certain phases in your life, that interest is gonna flow between different disciplines. No matter who you are and how good or bad you are in whatever areas, you should have some portion of your training always coming from a teacher. I would suggest you don't just randomly take whatever classes and whatever discipline you like each week, but it's also important not to constantly fight the passion and force yourself to train things you don't enjoy all the time. But flip that, and especially if you're designing your own training, it's super important to have the ability to assess your overall movement capabilities and address important weaknesses even if you don't particularly enjoy training them. This is one of the most important functions of a teacher because honestly, it's extremely hard to do on your own. Further, you should find, recruit, or create communities or partnerships that you can train in. There are an enormous number of things that you simply cannot train or develop in without other people. And even if you're an introvert like me, humans are social creatures and training with other people can and will develop relationships that can have an even more profound impact on your health than the training itself does. As far as what skill projects to choose, I suggest most people start with locomotion and inversions. Both will help you develop strength and mobility and can easily be practiced on your own almost anywhere. The locomotion will be a fantastic entry point towards dance, is generally very undeveloped, especially in men, and will also bring you significant development in 11 of our 16 axes. Inversions and hand balancing can also immediately be integrated into your locomotion, but most importantly, handstands are fun and it's perspective shifting for people to get upside down and balance and move on their hands. Imagine levitating off the floor and balancing on your hands comfortably whenever you want, however you want. How crazy would that be? It's not a lottery. A thousand hours of quality work or less, and you'll have it. And for most people, with just a few hours, you can start to taste it. Now, especially in those skill sessions, we wanna have an eye towards increasing complexity. Edo Portal famously has the Isolate, Integrate, Improvise framework for developing skills. For instance, you can start with isolated work on a forwards roll, backwards roll, and a cartwheel, or even sections of them. Then you can integrate them into a sequence, cartwheel into a backwards roll, and then you turn into a forwards roll. And then you can improvise with them in random sequences. This can and should be done within micro per session scales and on a macro time frame. But you should always have some work within each of those categories in every session and always be working to connect your isolated skills into more complex and improvised scenarios. There are two main reasons for this. First, specificity. This is what we actually want in the first place. You don't want to have your handstand on a remote island with one small bridge to it. You want to have it in the middle of a city with entrances and exits in every direction, a subway underneath and a helipad on top. So you can kick the handstand, press the handstand, bridge the handstand, cartwheel the handstand, QDR the handstand, macaco, chapeo, walkovers, and on and on. Second is something called contextual interference. So typically if you're working on something, you do one skill at a time, finish it, and then go to the next one. This is called blocked practice, but you could also do things together. For instance, if I tell you, do a forward roll, now do a backwards roll, now do a cartwheel. This is called random practice. Clearly, the random practice is harder. And the theory goes that when you do blocked practice, the skill is stored in your working memory. So it's easier and you'll get faster gains in performance within that session and feel better about yourself. But with random practice, you just did the forward roll, so that's in your working memory. And now you have to do a backwards roll and your brain is forced to recall the memory of backwards roll kind of from scratch which reinforces that memory. Interestingly, with random practice, we do worse during the entire session. But when we come back the next day, 
everything has improved more than it did with the blocked practice. We actually see greater brain activity, retention, and transfer of skills learned with random practice than in blocked. I won't use random practice for absolutely everything, but in every session, there should be some element of random recall of the skills you're working on. This also leads us to my stance on changing sides with reps. With harder skills that you aren't really capable of doing yet, I say, do all your reps on one side first, keep that skill in working memory, and use all the help you can get before doing the other side. But with anything you can perform reasonably well, switch sides on every rep for a bit more contextual interference and learning. Most importantly, in every session, aim to increase at least one parameter, range of motion, weight by one half to 1%, quality, duration by a second or two, or add one rep to one set for each exercise, or slightly decrease the rest intervals. But just pick one parameter at a time to increase for each exercise within the session. Don't forget about the Poliquin workout notation that I described here, or in the golden rule of progress for the intro to movement series, which you should really watch here if you haven't seen it at least once, because this video assumes that you've already seen the entire series. Special thanks to the members supporting this channel and leave any ideas or questions you have in the comments. Happy programming.